changes are coming to us faster than ever. And uh, his, his area of expertise is that future proofing, the decision making, and cognitive bias risk management in the future of work. So he serves as the CEO of the Future Proofing Consultancy, Disaster Avoidance Experts, which you can see on the screen, has, has his email and address there. Uh, so, and the, it specializes in, in helping forward looking leaders avoid dangerous threats and missed opportunities. So best-selling author of seven books. He is especially well-known for his global bestsellers, uh, Go With Your Gut. Uh, Never Go With Your Gut. Ne oh, no, I'm sorry. I said that wrong. Never Go With Your Gut. <laughs> the Blind sp Spots Between Us, uh, Returning to the Office, and, and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. So those are some short, short uh, snip from the names of the books. Uh, his writings have been translated into some other languages including Chinese, Korean, German, Russian, Polish, Spanish, French, and some additional languages. So the, the thought leadership that he's, he, he talks to us about was featured in over three, 550 articles and 450 interviews in some prominent venues, including Fortune Magazine, Time Business Insider, uh, Fast Company, and lots of other locations. So over 20 years in consulting, coaching, and speaking, and training, for mid-sized organizations today, uh, we're, we're lucky to have him on, on our section 1515. Uh, he is a PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and serves as a professor at the Ohio State University. So he is a Columbus, Ohio resident. So uh, I guess he's getting into the springtime, the beautiful springtime in, in Ohio at this point. Uh, so he's also, he makes sure that he spends time with his wife uh, to avoid the personal life turning into a disaster. So disaster avoidance, we all know what that is. Uh, so uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Gleb and uh, we can start in with our topic today. Thank you very Dr. much Gleb. for the I Appreciate the introduction, Ron. All right, everyone. So let's talk about how you as quality professionals can manage hybrid and remote teams. And in general, I heard some people working remotely our future world is going to be very much a hybrid world. And we'll talk about that and why I say that. So the structure of the presentation, we'll be talking about how we make decisions by hybrid and remote teams, some information from statistics, surveys, research on hybrid and remote work, and then some decision-making errors we tend to make in approaching hybrid and remote work. And finally, some techniques to make sure that we work in a hybrid work world effectively. So that's what the presentation will be about. So that's what you can anticipate. Now, I publish often, in addition to the venues that Ron described, I publish often in Quality Digest, which is, as you as quality professionals might know, widely read among quality professionals. You might find a lot of my articles there on managing hybrid and remote teams and decision-making and similar things. So check those out. All right, without further ado, let's talk about managing hybrid and remote teams. And I wanna start with something that you might've heard many leaders say, people are our greatest resource. People are our greatest resource. Have you heard leaders say that? Unfortunately, many leaders fail to live by that principle. So they say that people are their greatest resource, but they don't live by that principle because their comfort levels, they're comfortable with traditional office culture. So overwhelmingly, when you see tensions between leaders around and staff around hybrid work and remote work, you'll see the top level leadership wanting to have an office centric culture. And you'll see their staff wanting to have much more hybrid and remote work. Well, mm -hmm. the leaders are comfortable with office centric culture. That's what they're used to. That's how they're successful. But that contradicts, of course, the idea that people are our greatest resource because their people tend to want more remote work, tend to more, want more hybrid work. So the leaders want to turn back the clock to January 2020 and deny the reality of the last two years causing a major disruption in our values, habits, norms, predisposition, and what the future will look like. Now, many leaders see this as a big, big problem, the transition to the future of work, hybrid and remote work, and I want to encourage you to not see it that way and to help the leadership, the C-suite of folks, the operations folks, 
with whom you interact to not see it as a problem, as a source of worry, but as a major opportunity to maximize productivity and engagement. This transition to the future of work and what you're doing in your companies, how can you make sure that your companies have high productivity and have high engagement? And that's what you want to be thinking about. How can you use this crisis and turn it into an opportunity? That means putting aside assumptions, habits, and preferences, and focusing on what are your business objectives? What are your business outcomes? What's personally comfortable is not what you should focus on. We'll talk about why you should do it. And that has to do with the way that we think. The dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases that we make about the future of work. And how you can effectively have best practices on what the future of work will look like in that world that is honestly going to be much, much more hybrid than the world of January 2020. This information next is going to come from a number of independent surveys, eight major independent surveys by organizations like the Harvard Business School and Society for Human Resources Management. So not organizations that have a stake in some specific outcome, highly credible external organizations that asked people their preferences and desires and thoughts about the future of work. What it found is that 75 to 85% of workers, depending on the survey, don't want traditional office-centric work. They want hybrid work or remote work and 25 to 35%, so anywhere from a quarter to a third, again, depending on the survey, want full-time remote work, full-time remote work. 40 to 55% would leave their job according to the survey responses, if forced to come in full time. And that's what we're seeing in the great resignation. You've been seeing the great resignation, you've been experiencing it, maybe in your company, many of you, but certainly you've been seeing it in the newspapers, all of that. And what the great resignation is about is simply people leaving voluntarily their place of work because they're not given their preferred working arrangements. And according to the surveys, over 70% are less likely to leave if offered substantial remote work. So clearly it's remote work options are pretty important. Now, what the research shows is that remote employees are more productive, both according to surveys and according to peer reviewed observational research. On average, workers during the pandemic, when they transitioned to full-time remote work, worked over 20 hours more per month compared to before the pandemic. So that's about just under five hours a week. And that's essentially replacing the unpaid labor of the commute. The commute is the major reason that people don't want to go back to the office. And if they, if they work more time per week, they work just under just over four hours, four additional hours per week because they don't have to do the commute. Over 75% report higher or equal productivity working from home. And employees would be willing to take a 5 to 15% pay cut, 8% on average, for substantial remote work. Now, that, of course, doesn't mean I'm suggesting cutting the pay of people who have hybrid or remote schedules. That is a survey response that shows people's commitment to hybrid and remote work. Unfortunately, leaders tend to fall into a number of bad judgment errors when they approach hybrid and remote work. And so that's something that we want to realize and that we want to help leaders avoid. Now, before going into these dangerous judgment errors, I want to hear about your preferences. So you'll see a poll on the screen and you'll be able to vote for your preferred working style once we become fully safe from COVID, just intentionally into the future. What would you like to be your preferred working style? Would you want to do fully remote, coming in only rarely once a quarter for team building retreats, one day in the office, two days in the office, three days in the office, four days in the office, or full-time five days in the office? Please go ahead and vote. You should be able to see that on your screen. Go ahead and vote. Give you five more seconds to make your voice heard. Okay, so we see that about half of you would want fully remote, and one of you would want one day in the office, another one would want 
three days in the office. So clearly hybrid remote is the preference of the group here. So you'll, and this is going to be different from many leaders where many leaders, when you ask them what they would prefer, many of them would prefer four to five days a week in the office for themselves and their staff because of a series of decision-making errors. One of these dangerous judgment errors is called the status quo bias. Now, what's that about? The status quo bias has to do with, like all of these decision-making errors, these are cognitive biases, has to do with our emotions and our intuitions. Our emotions and intuitions are not aligned with the modern world. That actually evolved for the savanna environment. When we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people, where hunters, gatherers, and foragers. So that was a very dangerous and precarious environment. And if the situation changed, it was likely to be a bad change. So we have a strong intuitive desire to avoid change, to go against change. And leaders who have been successful in their leadership for 20, 30, 40 years, don't want to change how they lead. They're comfortable with their leadership style. So now that Omicron is passing and things seem like they're going better, they want to go back to the office. And so that's a desire to maintain or get back to what they perceive as the ideal status quo and downplaying of the disruption, the reality of the disruption to our habits, norms, and values from the pandemic. Another cognitive bias here is called the normalcy bias, the normalcy bias. We tend to assume that the future will be normal, will be much like today. That's what the normalcy bias is about. That's the essence of the normalcy bias. Now, that, of course, is not the reality. The future is increasingly disrupted. When we think about things like the pandemic or the supply chain and inflation, 2008-2009 fiscal crisis, various technological changes, the Russia-Ukraine war, the world is increasingly disrupted. When we forecast the future, we can't assume that it will be much like today. But that's not how it feels internally. Internally, it feels like current trends will continue and keep going. And so that's a big problem for leaders. We feel that things will continue going in a way that we perceive as normally, and we underestimate the likelihood and the impact of major threats. Another cognitive bias that is critically important to understand is called functional fixedness. Functional fixedness. Now, what you'll see is that some leaders will be dragged reluctantly kicking and screaming into the future of work. But once they try to have a hybrid modality, once they try to say, okay, maybe we'll go back to the office one to two days a week, they find that their traditional leadership style just doesn't work very well in this context. And they say, no, 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 this is not working. This hybrid modality is not working. We need to go back to the office for five days a week just because the, what we have isn't working right now. And that has to do with a cognitive bias, this dangerous judgment error of functional fixedness. You might have heard of this as the hammer nail syndrome. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, when you have one right way of functioning, of leading, of collaborating, of managing teams, then you will tend to impose that way, that traditional office culture way on hybrid work, on remote work. You've seen that happen during the pandemic. Companies during the March 2020 lockdowns transposed their in-office ways of working on fully remote work. That's not a good idea. It does not work very well. It's a different context. But that's what happened with companies. And they were not very successful in their culture damage. There, there were a lot of challenges. Well, guess what? It's not going to work on in hybrid work either. And companies are not realizing it. So they fail to adapt strategically to innovate anywhere and collaborate everywhere effectively. So that is a big, big problem that companies need to really be thinking about going forward. So these are the dangerous judgment errors that I wanted to highlight. And I wanted to ask you whether you saw these. So this will be a poll. I'll, this was a poll from a full, from a half day presentation. So I talked about more cognitive biases. I want you to only vote on the ones that are present here. The status quo bias, normalcy bias, and the false consensus. And the status quo bias, normalcy bias, and functional fixedness. So please go ahead and vote.
I'll give you five more seconds to make your voice heard. Go ahead and vote if you haven't voted yet. Okay, so we can see from the results of the normalcy bias, the assumption of future normality is overwhelmingly what people perceive to be the problem for their companies. That's good to know, and that's good for you to know. You can now bring this information to your leadership team and talk to them about, hey, these are the cognitive biases, the three biggest ones. I think that normalcy bias might be the biggest problem here, and you want to talk about that. And of course, you as quality leader, quality professionals and leaders know this probably particularly well. This tends to be a big, big problem in quality especially, because what, what tends to happen is that, well, you know, you cut corners, things may not go wrong right away. <laughs> things may be okay if you cut corners and if you don't really focus as much on quality as you really should. And they might be going okay for a while, but then things go really wrong. <laughs> and that is uh, the cause of uh, normalcy bias is the cause that think people think, well, we cut quality budgets, we're not spending as much time on quality, things are going okay, they're going normally, that's okay to cut quality some more. And then that's when they run into trouble. And of course, they can't build back their reputation and their quality again for a while, if that's not a good idea. And so the quality leaders tend to be especially sensitive to the normalcy bias. Now, let's think about what are going to be the best practices for competitive advantage in the future of work. If we're going to have this information about what most people want, we see the reality is that the world is going to be a hybrid world. The large companies are clearly moving into hybrid modalities. I've helped by now 19 corporations and organizations, a couple of government organizations move into, and some nonprofits, move into the future of work. And it's very clear that large corporations, one of my clients, I was just doing a presentation on this to a Fortune 200 company, a high-tech manufacturing company that has 29,000 people or something like that. And they're clearly moving into a hybrid and remote modality. They're hiring people from all over the globe, good talent, and the rest of the people are coming in one or two days a week. And some people are fully remote. We know that that's where the large companies are going and middle market companies will have to follow. We, it's really interesting that large companies are actually doing more hybrid and remote work. They're seeing more potential for this than middle market companies. Middle market companies tend to be a little bit behind the curve on hybrid and remote work. But of course, if they want to compete for talent, they're going to have to provide more hybrid and remote positions. And the middle market companies that succeed in making themselves a good place for hybrid and remote work are the ones that are going to get the competitive advantage in the future of work. And that competitive advantage means a team-led model. That means not a top-down CEO decision who says, we are going to come in two days a week, Tuesday and Friday. That's not what you want. <laughs> that is not the, model, the mode that research shows is the best practice. Instead, what you want is the team leads the supervisors of those smaller six to eight people teams, the rank and file teams, those are the folks you want making the decision for their teams in consultation with their team members, of course, for what to do and how many times to come in. So hybrid first, meaning one to two days a week and minority fully remote. That's generally what tends to work best for most companies. Out of all the companies that I helped, there was only one company that decided to do a home-centric model, meaning people can come in whenever they want, but largely working from home. The rest have a hybrid first model with a minority fully remote. Hybrid employees coming into the office one to three days a week, that's the majority, 70 to 90%, depending on the kind of workplace it is. So the high-tech manufacturing company, of course, has to have more people coming in, service professionals, tech professionals, they can have less people coming in. Fully remote employees are going to be the minority. And so you want to combine that with, ad with adopting best practices for hybrid and remote team management. So those are the dynamics that you want to be thinking about as you're going forward into the future of work. And before your people managers make decisions on returning to the office, you want to train them on these things. You want to train them on cognitive biases in the future of work. 
you want to train them on best practices for hybrid and remote work arrangements, which we'll get to next. And you want to help them decide, make the right decisions about the amount of hybrid in office work. It should be based on the amount of collaboration that you're doing. So the more collaboration your team does, the more time you should be spending in the office. When you look at the productivity metrics, you see that people are much, much more productive on their individual work when they work at home rather than they when they work in the office. And that's understandable. They can get focused work done. They're much less distracted. It's a much better place for their individual tasks. Collaborative tasks are more of a wash. You have some benefits to working at home. You have some benefits to working in the office for more intense collaborative tasks for more, most people, not all people, it's better to work in the office. So if you're going to have a hybrid team, then the amount of in-office work should be based on the amount of collaboration the team is doing. I strongly encourage my clients to establish a default of one day a week. That's enough for team building, team cohesion, you know, that once a week team meeting, interacting with other people that you want to interact with, and that is good enough. Then anything over that should be based on having the larger amount of collaboration. So you want to have your team managers submit a plan to HR for, hey, here's how we're going to have people come, um, have my people come to the office. And then, and the HR usually will want to review that for equity as you understand these things. And then the, the default is going to be coming in one day a week for most people, people who aren't fully remote, we're talking about hybrid workers. And then you want to have team leads justify them coming in more if they say well you know they're going to be coming in two days a week or this person is going to be coming in three days a week because he needs to work with multiple teams and he needs to do a lot of collaboration so if he's like, so something like that so those are the kinds of specific tactics that you want to work on so this is the kind of training that people managers need to get before returning to the office now as you return to the office, you want to really be thinking about the office space. You want to reshape your office space. The traditional office space is not a good fit for hybrid modality. First, get the information from team leaders. What are their plans for in-office work? You want to make sure they're not all coming in the same day. Get them to distribute. Usually, they'll come in one day a week on average. So get them to distribute those days throughout the week so that they're not all coming in on a Friday. And then figure out how much office space you need. And you know what? You'll find that you need much less office space. If you have your occupancy, if everyone's coming in on an average of one day a week, you know, maybe some two days a week, some three, others are fully remote, you have compared to your pre-pandemic occupancy of 20% occupancy compared to the 100% pre-pandemic. Well, guess what? You need much less real estate. Let's say you know, 20 to 30% is the average real estate for basic things like payroll, things like executive offices, all of those sorts of things, conference rooms. Then the rest of the space, you only need 20%, 30%, maybe 40% of the space you had before the pandemic for the rest of the people. So you can get rid of 50, 60, 40% of your office space and save a lot of money. That's a lot of money you can save. So that's, that's definitely beneficial. And then you want to change your office space to be mostly collaborative. People aren't going to come, be coming in and working on their individual tasks. That's not where they can be highly productive on their individual tasks. So you want to do something like shared desks, floating off floating desks, Co, uh, co-working spaces inside the office. And there are a number of varieties, but you want to change your office space to not have people have private desks unless they need to have private closed door conversations. So there are some executive offices, things like this, where people need to have private closed door conversations and they need to interact with outsiders, external stakeholders, so salespeople, for example if there you have people coming into your office too and, and selling them and stuff. But for the large majority of the people, there's no need for your individuals, for individual desks. And there's a much more of a need for collaborative spaces. So you, have, you need to have more conference rooms. You need to have more co-working spaces. You need to have more boardrooms and you need to set them up with good AV, high quality AV because you'll be having a lot of hybrid meetings. 
and you need to train people on how to have hybrid meetings effectively, as well as get high quality AV that's a good fit for hybrid meetings. I can talk about that in more detail on, in the question and answer session. Then you want to fund home offices. This is incredibly important. I can't emphasize this enough. Not nearly enough companies do this yet, and the ones that are going to be doing this are the ones that are getting ahead in the future of work. You have that savings from real estate. Fund home offices. Realize that the large majority of the work for your company is going to be done in the home office of your employee. Again, their individual task, which is for most people something like 70 to 90% of their work is their individual tasks. That's going to be done completely at home for the large majority of your staff. And that means you need to have their home office be as comfortable, as productive, and as secure, of course, as possible. So you need to have good internet connection, high-tech equipment, ergonomic furniture, soundproofing, room separators for those who don't have a separate office. They have things like, when I talk about equipment, I don't only talk about the laptop. I talk about things like a good quality microphone, lighting, all of those sorts of things. Remember, a good quality microphone is not something that's, if someone doesn't have a good quality microphone, if you, they're using their laptop microphone, that's not going to be bothering them. That's going to be bothering the people they're interacting with and impairing their communication to the people they're interacting with. The same thing for lighting, the same thing for qu camera quality. You want to make sure that these are not problems. Now, I'm curious whether you think your member, you or members of your team would benefit from funding for establishing that home office and acquiring good technology, broadband access, please go ahead and vote. You should have a poll in front of you. Okay, I'll give you five more seconds if you haven't made up your mind yet. Great, so we see that over two thirds of you would benefit. Great, and the rest have the technology and equipment they need, excellent. But yes, that means that the large majority of you over two thirds do not, and you would benefit from it. Okay, now, what about other things? How can you collaborate effectively in the space? One of the best methods of collaboration for hybrid teams and fully remote teams is to replace that in-person co-working that you had, whether with cubicles or open office spaces with virtual co-working. What does that mean? That means that you work along team members on a video conference call. A video conference call, much like this one, except without a presenter, you all start by dialing into a video conference call. And again, for hybrid teams on the days they're not coming into the office and for fully virtual teams. So now one hour video conference call per day, sign into the video conference call and just share what you'll work on. What project will you work on? And that's your individual tasks. That's not tasks that you're doing together with other people. Turn off your microphones, leave your speakers on and a video is optional. So you can have it on, you can have it off, whatever you prefer. As you have questions, ideas, you can turn on your microphone and share ask questions. And then team members can answer questions, discuss ideas if there's ideas for innovation. And you end by turning on the microphones and sharing what you accomplished. This is a really effective technique for team cohesion and cohesiveness and engagement with each other. That's one of the biggest things lost with hybrid teams and fully remote teams. So that sense of connection and cohesion to each other. And this virtual co-working helps address this very, very serious problem. It helps teams bond. It also helps innovation. And that's a very valuable activity, of course. How do you stay and grow more innovative in this environment? Well, virtual co-working is when you can have ideas and share them. And this is also especially helpful for junior team members. One of the biggest challenges during the pandemic has been how do you integrate new people into the team? How do you get them to learn about other team members? How do you help them bond? Virtual co-working is a great way to do that because you'll find that new team members generally are the ones with more questions and they'll be asking questions in a quick, casual way, getting mentoring from, from more senior team members. They can do things like just verbally answer questions. They can do things like screen sharing, 
There's a lot of ways you can do this, but this is a really effective technique to help teams engage more effectively with each other and build team cohesion. Now, another way you can address some of the problems with team cohesion, specifically the more social parts, is by having a technique called a virtual water cooler. The water cooler is something that people definitely miss, just chatting to each other, break room conversations, water cooler conversations, right? And it doesn't really work well to just have that in a virtual meeting where you all come and you're forced to interact in a Zoom happy hour or something like that. That does not have the same quality and people feel drained and disengaged from Zoom happy hours. That's what the research shows. So you want to instead have a native virtual format for engagement with each other. Have a personal channel for each team in your collaboration software, whether it's Slack, Microsoft Teams, Trello, Asana, and each team starts their day with a daily share. Answering things like, how are you feeling? How's your personal life going? A fact about yourself or the world that other people don't know about and what you plan to work on that day. And that gets you really engaged with other people and humanizes you to them. And you also respond to free other people who do their daily sharing. Then you can use that channel to chat to others during the rest of the day. And that's not obligatory. The personal, the daily sharing is obligatory. And this helps team members really connect on the human level. It's a very valuable technique. Now, another thing that you want to be thinking about is accountability. How do you hold people accountable in this new world, in this future of work, where you don't see them? This is something that leaders tell me is one of the biggest, biggest obstacles to them supporting hybrid and remote work. Well, what you want to do is not have the once a year annual large performance evaluations or quarterly performance evaluations. Instead, you want to break that down into many, many frequent weekly or biweekly performance evaluations. So focusing not on how you perceive the employee to do or their presence, but what they deliver, what they accomplish, how well did they meet their goals, their tasks, their productivity and their individual tasks and collaborative group tasks. And think and focus on the quality of these deliverables on a weekly or biweekly level. Remember the phrase that what gets managed gets measured, gets managed. So what gets measured gets managed. So focus on whatever you want to actually make sure people do well. So moving to those small scale weekly evaluations and check-in meetings, you get good deliverables, what you want, and thus make sure that you get your business outcomes. Another benefit is well-being and burnout. So people who are working in hybrid and remote settings, supervisors tend to be less engaged with them. So I see them less so they can are they're not as able to notice signs of burnout and other problems and provide that support. But if you have this weekly check-in, you're much, much more likely to address these problems. And you can also, this saves a lot of time because you can, employees tend to save up their questions for that weekly check-in. It's very helpful for leaders in not having a bunch of meetings with employees they don't need. Another benefit is building strong relationships. Now, research shows that a strong relationship with your immediate team lead, with your supervisor, is the biggest, biggest component of whether you're going to be productive, engaged, and retained. So retention, very important. So that is really crucial. This is a key for getting employees engaged with a company culture and retaining them. So integration, retention, engagement, morale, and productivity. Finally, I want to highlight how important it is to provide training. Providing training is critical. People are not used to working in a hybrid modality. So if you're going to have a hybrid first mode, that's neither fully mode nor fully in-person. And that is a big problem because people don't know how to do it. Effective hybrid work means people need to know what to do at home, what to focus on the office, how to prepare effectively for their limited amount of time in the office, how to have hybrid meetings effectively, how to communicate effectively in virtual settings, collaborate effectively in virtual settings, with other people. If they're in the office, other people are at home, how do we communicate with them and so on. So this, these are critical things on which you want to provide people with training. Okay, takeaways. This is a key inflection on the future of work. And you wanna be thinking about this as a key inflection. You want to integrate addressing the decision-making cognitive biases into the culture of your organization. You want to optimize those business outcomes and the future of work 
despite some personal discomfort that leaders might be feeling about this. Use the team-led hybrid first model and minority quality mode to get retention of best talent, poach competitors, address long tail risks so that normalcy bias, the low likelihood, high impact probabilities, and to adapt your culture to collaborate everywhere, measure deliverables and high collaboration. And you are empowered. You have some flexibility to adopt at least some of these methods in the short term. You can do so immediately after this talk. And that's what I strongly encourage you to do. You see that these techniques are going to be useful and applicable and valuable for you. So start integrating them. You can do it. You are empowered. You have the ability. And not everything, of course. You are not the supreme leader of your organization. You're not the CEO, unless you happen to run a quality leadership, quality consulting firm. But you can already integrate some of these techniques like day, like that virtual co-working of, or that daily sharing into your own teams. You can gain a competitive advantage internally and externally, and that will help you thrive in this key inflection on the future world. Because believe me, the people who can work effectively in a hybrid and remote modality will be the ones who are the most desirable employees and leaders in four companies going forward. All right, everyone. That's what I want to share, and you'll get some free additional resources if you wish. My best-selling book, the digital copy of Returning to Office, Benchmarking to Best Practices for Competitive Advantage, and a free coaching session available for the first three claimants. And that will be based on a poll. So please go ahead and vote whether you would like the resources. And in the meantime, I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, this is Jay Stahan. Uh, give you a quick summation of my background is I worked, I started out of college in quality control, quality mm -hmm. engineering in 1973. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an idea of my age. I retired, semi-retired in uh, 2000. And 19 mid year. And Good so, I'm very interested. Uh, obviously, what you've just presented, since I am today working remotely, mm -hmm. uh, part time with my former employer who I retired from, mm. who talked me into staying with them. Uh, I wanted to retire and they said, we don't want you to retire. So we came up with a compromise that I could work virtually part-time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's my first experience at uh, virtual employment. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the things you've hit upon are exactly things that have crossed my mind Mm. since I retired from, like so many others, going into the office every day, uh, certainly in quality control, where we have processes that we have to oversee. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times uh, it's difficult to do that remotely mm -hmm. because of the hands-on nature of the interface with the team members, as well as the actual item of which you're manufacturing or distributing and so on. So uh, working remotely totally in that profession, I think has some challenges, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, I've been able to address a lot of them, to adjust to a lot of them and overcome them. So your presentation for me uh, was outstanding. Oh, thank uh, you very much. Uh, really hit, uh, really hit a lot of uh, buttons that I've that I've come in contact with since my uh, change of status from full time retirement to part time reti retirement. <laughs> I do have a couple of questions, and I'll try yes. not to uh, take too much time of all our of all the other attendees. I do have two two questions. One, how did you come to start on this venture of you know, somewhere along the line, something must have crossed your path, your research, whatever, to say this is an area that's 
up and coming, and that could have been years ago, mm -hmm. and this area needs attention. And my second question is, uh, for those of us that are still working with a company that has remote employees, uh, is there any type of survey that is recommended to give to the employees of the company, mm. both to those individuals that are working remotely, as well as to those individuals that are not working remotely? So happy to answer those questions. And thank you so much for your kind words about my presentation. Well, the easy answer to the survey is that the appendix to my book contains a full range of questions for all the companies that, and nonprofits and government organizations, mostly companies that I have had, that I've worked with 19 companies, several nonprofits and government organizations, and it has a range of questions. So you'll be, can take those questions and adapt them to your specific needs. So the appendix to my book is going to help you with that survey. And that's the first one. So that's the second question. But going back to the first one, what really got me interested in this question was actually the topic of performance evaluations. And here's the thing. Performance evaluations have been bad for a, pro, for a long time. The traditional annual performance evaluation even if we quarterly performance evaluations have long been shown by research in behavioral science, which is my area of expertise, to not work very well. And so I started looking at, okay, what works well in these contexts, in these settings? And it figured out that, okay, switching from a focus on the broad general impressions of the manager about the employee to deliverables focused in a focused way on specific weekly or bi-weekly, so twice a month, or every two weeks or every week, those meetings works much better even in person. And then that led me to research before the pandemic already, what happens with people who work remotely, because of course the traditional, you had something like about two, 3% of people working full-time remotely, what happens with them when they do traditional evaluations? Well, it doesn't work very well for them. It's worked especially badly because the manager can't see them. And so that, that's a especially serious problem. So that's kind of how I got into this. And that was a while ago. And of course, that caused me to be familiar with research on working remotely when the pandemic hit. And that's when I really shifted my focus from simple not simple, but what I used to focus on purely was decision-making and risk management, that future-proofing and the future of work in general. But that pandemic caused me to really focus on hybrid and remote work as my area of interest. Thank you for the question, Jay. Questions? Uh, yes, and uh, that's an excellent uh, answer, uh, you know, which I can understand, therefore, given your background in the behavioral sciences, and how that would lead uh, to what you're actively working on today. And uh, with all respect to the many presentations I've uh, been involved with, with, uh, with the various uh, ASQ sections, uh, it's so refreshing you know, to, to think of something that is on the forefront. And I think something that uh, all of us have to look at there may be some of us that don't have to deal with this, given the fact there's no remote uh, employees and uh, good for them. Uh, they're, they're very fortunate. Uh, but for many of us, including myself, uh, this is, you know, this is a you know, brand new horizon for mm -hmm. us. And uh, I'm always challenging myself to be sure that even though I'm remote, remote on a part-time basis, that I'm giving back to the company mm -hmm. uh, that I'm serving to be sure that I'm a value add. So, so, so it's very challenging, but uh, uh, you've given me a lot of things to think about. So thank you very much. You're very welcome, Jim. So glad to help. Other folks, uh, Ron, you had a question and you're on mute. You'll, you'll, Ron, uh, you'll want to unmute if you want to ask the question. 
Okay, so uh, Dr. Gleb, we, on, we had a young data scientist uh, in the middle of last year who moved up from Florida, we're in Florida <laughs> here, to North Carolina and was working remotely. Uh, at some point though, after three or four months, they kind of moved him out of the company, right? Mm -hmm. Because they didn't like that remote approach. That, that So uh, it's a shame because he was a very young, talented uh, data scientist and so are you saying that the, the companies that are refusing to, in, to engage in this kind of remote will slowly have a deterioration of their quality of their workforce? No question. Would that be yep. true? Absolutely. You're seeing younger people definitely on average want to work more. They do not, on average, younger people want much less office centric for work than older people. That means mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that they only some want full time remote work and some want hybrid work. You see that overall, the kind of workforce that wants to do office-centric work tends to be less digitally savvy. And the world is going increasingly reliant on technology and the world is increasingly yeah. reliant on data, like the data scientist that you mentioned. And the world is going to be turning more and more against Jurassic companies that are only office-centric. So I can guarantee to you that the future of work is hybrid. Yeah, and the slowly the workforce will slowly but surely not be as leading edge as they were before. Exactly. Okay. Ron, if I could add to the, your comment, uh, it was a very good comment. Uh, given my experience with my current employer who I'm working remotely, uh, the individuals who own the company and it was founded maybe 27 years ago, uh, the really driver of the company, one of those two individuals, uh, when I joined that company in 2006, had one remote person and they sort of uh, were forced to put up with that remote person because they were a software coding individual Mm -hmm. and they could not find anybody else that had the unique skills <laughs> of this unique individual. So therefore they had to put up with the fact that they worked remotely, but the top management did not like people working remotely. One, because they were both sales type people, love that personal touch coming to the office, the touchy feeling, all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And secondarily did not trust people to work from home thinking that they're not gonna provide them 30, 40 hours of full, of full service. So, uh, however, today there is probably, I think around six or six that are working remotely. And so to where I'm going with this is to answer your question from my experience, it begins as we heard, we've heard so many times over the years is ready to have their people work remotely my opinion is there'll be a, a way that that top management and the employees will figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. If the top management doesn't believe in it and doesn't want it, my opinion is those employees that want it are probably going to have to go elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, I, I you know, I was asking Dr. Gleb's opinion on it because it seems like our, you know, HR recruiting people are just going to be losing out on potential good candidates going forward. Exactly. You, you're absolutely right. They are. And the candidates they're losing on are going to be more innovative, more willing to, because this is, when you look at the top desired of outside of income, what people desire most is flexibility. When you look at surveys, when you look at responses, flexibility is the number one desire of people. And so flexibility is what drives the after income is the next driver. So you'll be having to pay a lot more money to get good talent, or you'll be losing out on the talent. And I presume, unless you're a company like that, that can afford to pay top dollar, oh, you'll still be, some people will never work in the office or so that, that's not going to happen. And other people, you'll have to pay a lot more money and that's not going to be profitable. It's going to cause those companies to decline. Yeah. Uh, William, or do you prefer Bill? Go ahead. I go by either, but yeah, you can call me Bill. Um, Great. I have, two, I have two questions. One is, um, it, it seems like, especially with the advent of 5G, that, that uh, remote office is, is not just home office, but 
potentially becoming anywhere office? That you know, is it, it, that is true, but the home office is in terms of security, cybersecurity. That's something I definitely recommend that people think mm -hmm. about. Okay. And that's one of the reasons I strongly encourage companies to fund home offices from the perspective of comfort, ergonomics, as well as cybersecurity, because that's where you can have various things that would be protective. So that's something to think about. Good point. And my second question is, uh, it seems like there is um, maybe a movement towards or a change in the relationship, the employer-employee relationship to where that whole relationship might be going away, otherwise known as the great resignation and many employees leaving their employers to become independent contractors um, where you know, now those employees are independent contractors who don't work for just one, one boss or one employer, but for multiple clients. And do you see that growing and I'd be interested in your thoughts on the implications of that, if you do see that growing. Well, definitely seeing more people becoming contractors. And that's one of the real benefits of having a, that performance evaluation that I mentioned, where it's deliverables oriented and looking at tasks. And so that goes to the question of like some, some bosses saying, well, I don't trust the, I might not trust people to deliver the full 30, 40 hours. Well, look at their tasks, look at what they delivered, look at what they accomplished. Why should you care how much time they worked, you know, lugging every keystroke, right? Look at what they delivered. What are their deliverables? What did they do for you? So that's what you really should be focusing on. So if companies are doing, focusing on deliverables, that's going to be much, much better for them than if they're focusing on how much time people are spending working. So that's kind of one, part of answering your question. The other part is looking at why people are becoming, you know, you, there can be contractors. One of the reasons people become contractors is for the tax benefits. Oh, the Trump tax cuts made it more profitable from an individual perspective to be a contractor rather than a full-time employee for some categories of jobs. So somebody might be doing the full thing that they were doing as an employee, but outside of that traditional relationship as a contractor, purely for a tax reasons. So rather than for any actual change of activities reasons. Thank you, those are some great points. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Any, any other questions for Dr. Gleb? Well, I have no questions, but I just want to say it's uh, great to see the names of Mauricio and Mikhail and Steve and Ron and Rafael, uh, folks I've uh, uh, enjoyed being with uh, for, for many years, uh, so we don't get a chance to be together again, but uh, good to see those smiling faces and good to see your faces again, and I wish everybody well. Yeah, Thanks, Jay. Good, good, to, good to see you again as well, uh, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Okay. Uh, what we can do at this point, Ron, without further ado, we do have, as we said at the beginning, we have uh, some books to give away on a raffle. And what I could do is I'll do it on the screen. Hold on a second. Let me share my screen. Oh, we're going to have a random number generator here? Yes. All right, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I will uh, send the materials to those who wanted it. Thank you, Dr. Gleb. Excellent, excellent yeah, thank uh, you, presentation. Thank you. Very good. thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So what we do, um, I have the list of names you'll see here on this little spreadsheet here that everybody's listed.